find me in this place again prone to wander lost in sin when i confess i am blessed i will turn my heart to you you are faithful and so true when i confess i am blessed there's no better place to be than to sit down at your feet and to live in fellowship so sweet when you leave me i will follow all the way all the way when you go i'll go with you all the way all the way joy will come and peace will stay when i trust you and obey help me do whatever you say all the way all the way I will rise up from defeat. You have won the victory. You will turn grace into praise. Not a shadow or a fear can abide when you are near. By your word, I know that you are here. When you need me, I will follow all the way, all the way. When you go, I'll go with you all the way, all the way. The joy will come and peace will stay when I trust you and obey. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. Trust and obey. Trials and 
temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We just bring needs that are before you, Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody, if you could close your eyes. If you're sick in body, know someone is sick in body, and you're crying out to God for them, just raise your hand. Just trust God for the healing. Lord, we're trusting you, Lord. You see all these hands. Father God, in, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bring healing, oh God, for those who are sick in body, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You promise, oh Lord, by your word, oh God, but by your stripes we are healed. We ask you to move by your side for mercy, Lord, to bring healing. Hallelujah. Lord, just do this, Lord, for all those. Have mercy, O oh God. In the name of Jesus. I 
and turn this thing around. Yeah. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. That's all that my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Oh, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I know you can. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Can we all please stand? Our scripture reading is from Psalm 136, verses 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. You may be seated. I want to welcome everybody this morning and those online, you may be having some trouble. We have some issues going on with the streaming service. It's like chopping up the video. So I encourage you, if you're really having struggle with it this morning, to go back and watch it again. The recording will be fine, but it just seems to be breaking up for some reason, and we can't quite get to the bottom of it. But hang in there with us. We appreciate you being there. And again, thank you all for coming this morning. 
If you have your Bibles, if you'll open to Judges chapter 7, we're going to pick up in verse 3 there this morning. And our title this morning is, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory. Father, thank you so much for our time together this morning. We thank you that you are the focus of our gathering. It's really not about us. It is to you. You sent your son for us. While we were yet sinners, you came for us. And and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your love for us. But when we're in relationship with you, we have to get out of the mindset that it's all about us and what we have, what we want, and all the fleshly desires. It's it's all about your desires now flowing through us. It's all about this relationship that you, Lord, through the new covenant, have initiated and are sustaining in us. And I thank you for that. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say. And let us walk away closer to you, Lord, than we've ever been, because, Lord, that's the only place that's a safe place, is in relationship with you. So we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, recapping last week in our last study, we saw God's patience toward Gideon as he needed the signs to make sure it was God leading him and calling him uh, to battle, him and Israel to battle. And God knows the heart, and he was patient. He was very patient. But God already had the plan in place. And he knew that he would fight the battle for Gideon, just as he fights our battles today. The, the wonderful thing that we, we can grab a hold of in our relationship is there's no battle too strong. There's no army coming against us that's not already defeated in the spirit realm. We're so many times focused on the on the, the, the thing in front of us, that mountain, that wave, that storm. But that storm is going to pass because we are in Jesus Christ. We are in relationship with him. He's already got this battle won. And for Israel, God already knew what was about to happen. For us, it's okay to seek confirmation. You know, many times we, we, we kind of feel guilty if we question or, or have some doubts. And that's that fleshly nature we still struggle with. It's there. We're going to have those times where there's doubt. It's okay to seek confirmation. But here's the thing. The Word gives us confirmation. The Spirit gives us confirmation. And sometimes God uses other people in our lives to come and affirm what God's already spoken to us. A word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a, a, pro a prophetic word. Many times someone will come and they don't even know they're bringing a prophetic word, but they're coming and they're speaking to you, and all of a sudden there's something in that conversation that confirms that God has already, something God has already told you. So once we have the confirmation, we have to move forward. And whatever it is, we have to be prepared to move forward. It, it's, it's, it's like we sometimes say, God, show me the way, show me the way, show me the way. And there's the way. And we say, okay, let me sit on it for a while. And he said, look, I've already confirmed it. I've given you everything that you need. And as believers, we have everything we need to walk in relationship. And when I'm saying walking, that means not sitting still. It means not just curling up and saying, okay, I'm being fed. Now feed me more, feed me more. That's what babies do. They want to be fed. They want to be clean. They want to be fed. They want to be clean. They want to sleep a while, very little. Then they want to be fed, and then they want to, they want to be clean. That's what babies do. We are not to be babes in Christ. We're to move from the milk to the meat. And as we move into that, he's going to challenge us. We're going to face challenges. Sometimes those challenges come from the enemy trying to tempt us and draw us away. But sometimes God puts us in places where there's a little uncomfortableness going on so he can challenge us to keep our eyes on him. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, there's a lot of fear today in our culture because of these movements, these cultural movements that have crossed over the country and are, are driving, driving the culture. We've got to be this, we've got to be that, we've got to accept this, we've got to accept that. And all of these things are being force-fed down our throats. And these fears can be real because you're afraid of what someone's going to do. It's getting violent out there. If you disagree with someone, it's no longer just a dis uh, debate or discussion. It now gets emotionally charged, and when those emotions rise, it can get violent. 
But we're not to be afraid of those things, even though the media has taken hold of these cultural movements and they have them on their side spewing it. The interesting thing about it is the actual numbers or percentages of people who are political or cultural activists is not that high. It's just that they're being amplified. And because they're being amplified, it appears to be so much bigger, and so people will cower down. Oh, this is a huge thing. We can't face that. We don't know what to do. But I'm going to tell you something. These are all driven by demonics in the realm of the demonic field, and it appears to be bigger and louder than they are. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We need to grab a hold of that. This is a spiritual battle, not a fleshly one. We need to understand that as long as we're believers in this world, we're going to be facing head on with the cultural war. It's getting bigger. It's getting louder. But we're not fighting the battle. As I said earlier, it's a spiritual battle and it's already won. Ephesians six twelve through 13 tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, we stand in his armor. Now, I know that we've prayed that prayer. I, I think that people have studied Ephesians 6 many, many, many times, and we pray that armor of God over us. But I want you to understand, as you're praying the armor of God over you, you understand you're praying God to clothe you. God is clothing you in his armor. It's Jesus. We're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're carrying that armor, but we're not able to put it on in our flesh. This is a spiritual thing. God has to clothe us in his righteousness. And if we come in saying, oh, I'm going to take up this armor, and I'm going to put on this armor, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. Even though it's his armor, if he's not the one clothing you in it because you're in relationship, it becomes just a routine or a ritual, and it won't work. And I've heard people say, oh, I've tried that Jesus stuff. I've tried all that stuff. It don't work. It don't work because you're trying it. You're not supposed to try anything. You're supposed to surrender. Let him put it on you. Let him clothe you. Let him lead you. It is his battle, and he We'll get the glory. This is something we have to understand. The battle is fought with his armor and by his hand. But we have to remain faithful to the full counsel of his word. Continually in prayer. And led by the spirit. So we know where our place is in the battle. And a lot of times we think, well, we have this urge. We want to just jump in the battle. Listen, if God's not putting you there, don't get there. You're in the wrong place. He will lead you where he wants you to go, and he will confirm where he wants you to go. Now, I will say it's probably not going to be a comfortable place, but we don't need to put ourselves in the uncomfortable place. Let him put us where he wants us so we're growing and, and we're continuing keeping our eyes on him. Once it's confirmed where we must be, then we must go where he sends us. Now, for Gideon, once it was confirmed in his heart and in his mind, he's ready to go. He's already called. He's, he's blown the trumpet. And all these men have shown up. But here's the problem. There's too many of them. There's too many. There was too many for him to, to do what God wanted him to do because he knew that Israel would get the big head. Just like we do in a victory. Look, look what happened. Wow. Man, did I do that? No. You didn't do that. God did it. He used you, but God did it. And we have to make sure we keep that, that mindset. See, nobody's going to share God's glory. So this week, we're going to pick up at the point where God whittles this army down. So let's begin in Judges chapter 7, verses, verses 3 through 7. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid. Now, this is God speaking to Gideon. And he's saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned. Well, I'm one of them. Bye, guys. <laughs> I got a little fear. I'm not facing this. I'm gone. So only 10,000 remain. They say, wow, that's a big cut. That's huge. 22,000 of the people returned. 10,000 remain. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, 
the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Well, I don't know about you, but if I were Gideon, this would be terrifying. I mean, think about it. He's already had to ask God to prove himself three times. First, if it's really you, let me go get a sacrifice. Then I'm going to put this fleece out. Okay, now I'm going to do the opposite thing with this fleece. I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. Now he's ready to go, and God says, no, you can't go yet. You got too many. I, I cannot imagine what was going on in his mind. And you have to remember the, the enemy's army was vast without number. And he's starting with a mere 32,000. Now, God takes 22,000 of them, sends them home. I'm sure that's not what Gideon was expecting and probably wonders what 10,000 soldiers are going to be able to do against this vast army. But God wasn't done. He's still, there's too many, and so he brings them down to 300. Some might say, well, that's a bait and switch. First of all, I tell Gideon, I've got you. Go get all the guys together. Now he says, now you're not going with all those guys. We're going to take it down. And I'm not sure about this. I mean, Think about what we might do. I'm talking about where we are mentally today. Okay, God, nope, uh uh-uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. You said, and I did, and now you're doing this? No, that's, no, you should have told me the whole thing up front. This is too big. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not doing it. Think about this in a percentage. From 32,000 soldiers, God brings it down to less than 1% of those 32,000. 0.9375% exactly of an army. Now here's Gideon. Okay, (laughs) now what? I think I'd be heading as far in the opposite direction as fast as I can. Of course, that's what Jonah did. That didn't work well for him either, did it? When God says he has it, he has it. But God has us at this place of complete dependency. Now, there are many in our culture today, in the church today, say, no, that's not what Christianity is all about. We have to do our part first, then God will do the rest. Show me. Show me where the Bible tells us that. That is Americanized Christianity. It doesn't work anywhere else in the world. You go to some third world country and say, I'm going to do all this, and then God's going to do the rest. You have nothing to do with. It's all God. It's always been all God. But we're the ones who have gotten fat and happy. We're the ones who have gotten comfortable. We're the ones that says, this is the system, therefore we have to work the system. God says, no, you're in the world, you're not of the world, so therefore the system really doesn't apply, does it? We have to navigate in it, but we don't have to actually depend upon it. It's God's hand that provides We say that, oh, God's my provider. Really? Quit your job. Uh, No, we have to have a job. This is how God provides in this country, so therefore we have to do it this way. That's not biblical. I'm sorry, it's just not. Now, I'm not telling anybody to quit their job because I do believe that God does provide how he sets up for us to do. But we're not to become so dependent upon that that we put God in this box and say, this is the only way. That we can succeed in this land. That's bogus. It's not biblical. And we've got to get out of that mindset. God is bringing Gideon to a complete place of dependency. That's where he needed him to be. And he needs us to be there too. God often brings us to our knees through the trials that we go through. So that we come to the end of ourselves. We come to the end of ourselves and say, I can do nothing now. What am I supposed to do? I guess now it's time to pray. 
And we've all said that. Oh, we've done all we can, so I guess now it's time to pray. Well, why weren't you praying before you even tried to do all you could? Because God would direct what you're supposed to do when you pray. No more ideas, no plans, no schemes to figure out how to get out of the circumstance we're currently facing. God wants to do the work in us. And Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So what that really means is, is that you really can see something and figure this is your way of getting it done, but that's not how faith works. Faith says, I'm going to do the work. This is God speaking. I'm going to do the work through things that you don't even understand, things you can't see. Then therefore we say, okay, I believe you, God. I put my hope in you. So in other words, in this fleshly mindset, we do not see what actually is. And these eyes and these ears can bring a lot of fear and a lot of conflict in our relationship with God because we're seeing this army rising up against us, this cultural army, where they're focusing on things that are so ugly and so despised in God's eyes, and yet that's becoming what's important to our culture. And we look at that and we say, oh, 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 no, no, that's too big. God, we can't fight this. God will say, you're right, you can't, but I can. Trust me. Trust me. And in that trust, it means you stand firm on my word. You don't waver with what I'm telling you. You don't waver in the word of God and in your faith. Only God sees the whole picture. We have finite minds. His, eyes is not, his mind is not finite. It's infinite. He knows all. He sees all. He's already got it all worked out. And what we see is not what actually is. So whatever he has called you to do is already accomplished. It's already accomplished. Let's look at the prayer that Jesus prayed for you and me. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26, he just prayed for his disciples. And now he prays for all of us. And he says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all, may, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I having given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect, made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave, gave me may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory which you've given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I've declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. We are in him. We are in him. One as he is with the Father and the Father in he, we are now in him and he is in us. This is what he prayed. This is what he was praying for us even then. And this is already accomplished now for those who believe. We are now in him. We are one with him. Therefore, we have his strength. We have his uh, glory in us. Not that we're glorified, but his glory is in us to push us and to teach us and to lead us and to guide us and to use us. And nothing can take that away from us. Nothing can take it away. We are one with him. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we believe that? Do we grab a hold of that? If that's the case, then why are we in fear of what's going on around us? 
We need to stand firm and say, I need not be afraid of that. What can man do to me? I'm in one in Jesus. And Jesus and the Father one. I am one with them. We are all together. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. And we follow. And we live. And we obey. And we say, you know what? I don't understand it all. I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand what's going on over here. I'm seeing it with my eyes. And I'm saying, whoo, that's pretty bad. But God says, I know that's how you see it. But let me show you through faith how I see it. The battle is already won. It's done. It's accomplished. Now, not everyone that calls himself Lord, Lord will be in heaven. Not everyone who, who says they believe will be there. Because belief is not just a word that we toss around. Belief requires action. Belief requires you to say, okay, if I believe, then therefore I'm going to move as though I believe. If I say I believe and I'm going as though I don't, then there's a problem. Minds to rest and displace all the fear. It should push it away. There's no place for fear. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. But of love and power and of a sound mind. For some of us. The sound mind part I'm talking about. <laughs> now this is what he says. I did not give you the spirit of fear. That is from the enemy. And that is from our flesh. And the enemy knows our flesh. And he plays on it. But we can be, a, we can be strong in Jesus. And we can be at rest. And honestly. The fruit of the spirit. All the fruits of the spirit that are listed. Are found when we're at rest with him when we're at peace with him his peace gives he, he comes with the peace the joy the, the peace the love the gentleness the kindness the self-control everything that he gives us is when we come to a place of surrender and a place of surrender is when you say it's you jesus it's all you that's where we find the peace that's where we find the joy but if you're struggling with trying to understand things you can't understand, if you're struggling with trying to fix things you can't fix, if you're struggling with doubt and fear, there's no rest there. And if there's no rest there, there's no peace there. You can't have the peace of God until you find peace with God. That's relational. That's not relational. Rather, those who praise Him and worship Him for who He is. We're all responsible and accountable for our heart of worship. Each one of us, we're accountable. And it should be a lifestyle, not an event. Just as everything else. Salvation is not an event that took place when we prayed a prayer. Salvation is a lifestyle that begins when that prayer is prayed. And it's ongoing. It's not just about, oh, I did this, I'm done. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. And John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. And those who worship, worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. And for those who are trying to grow a church by bringing outside in, that's the wrong way. It's not about adding numbers. It's not about filling the seats. It's about growing inside, letting that flow outside, not bringing the outside in so you can say, look, we have a big church. That's not worship either because half the people are there don't even know Jesus. You're just filling the seats. It's all about the relationship. It's all about the relationship, and we are accountable to God for that. Gideon was worshiping. Now, you might say, well, yeah, he worshiped because he heard this and God confirmed. But God confirms in us every day who he is, what he's doing, and how it's all going to work according to his plan. 
It's all written in the word. We know the end. We win. Because he's already won. We should be in a place of worship. Not doubt and fear. Now verses 16 through 25. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies. And put a trumpet into every man's hand. With empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. One guy. One guy said the other day, just came to my mind, he said, well, probably the reason God whittled it down to 300 is they didn't have enough pitchers and torches. <laughs> well, he could have created more pitchers and torches, couldn't he? But no, that wasn't why they whittled him down. Anyway, and he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword, of the, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch. And just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. Very important point. They did what they were supposed to do. And then they stood. They stood right where they were supposed to be. Verse 22, and the 300 blew the trumpets. The Lord said, every man soared against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Achaia, Acacia, I'm sorry, toward Zerera. As far as the border of Abel, Mahola, by Tabith, and the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Then the Gideon, then Gideon sent messages throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, "Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Bera and the Jordan." Then all of the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Bera and the Jordan, and they captured two princes of the Midianites. Oreb and Zeb, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. So the victory is won. The victory is won. God turned the enemy upon themselves, and those that didn't die fled. They all took off. Now notice the 300, again, only blew their trumpets, broke the jars that held the torches and yelled out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And then they stood in place and God did the rest. They didn't go beyond what God called them to do. They were obedient. They stood in place. As believers today, it's extremely difficult to come to this place where we trust God completely. It is. It's hard. This fleshly nature has, such in, has in, in, engraved in our system from the time we're born all the way through life. And we have been taught all the way through our life that we have to take care of ourselves, that we have to find a way to solve our problems, that we have to do this and we have to do that. And when we come to this place, now we meet Jesus. He says, no more of that. You depend upon me. I am your source of all things. And that's very difficult because it leaves us physically, mentally, emotionally vulnerable. We're in a vulnerable place. If you're looking at everything around you and you say, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the target here. It's all coming on me. And Jesus says, no, you're not. They're coming against me. You are now mine. Trust me. That's what he wants us to do. But we have to come to the place where we trust God completely until we come to this point where we're completely out of our own strength. We're completely bring nothing to the table. And we completely say, okay, God, I trust. See, here in our culture, we have so much at our disposal. The clothing stores aren't closed lately. Now, some of the malls are, but that's just cultural change there too. A lot of people are just afraid to go to the mall, afraid to get mugged. So they're not going. They're buying online. <laughs> But the clothing stores are still there. Food, grocery stores, while some of the shelves are bare, most of them's not. 
you can find pretty much everything you need. Cars, yeah, they may not have as many on the lots right now, but you can still order them. You can still get your car. Houses, whoo. They're just digging up land and building apartments and homes everywhere. There's always going to be a place for somebody to live. Money in the bank, it's all there. But even when things are in question, we're constantly trying to figure out how we're going to hang on to it. How can we make that next payment? How can we do this? How can we have that? How can we find this? How can we find that? We act as though all of these things are our own security. When in reality, there is nothing secure in the worldly system. Absolutely nothing. See, when God moved in Israel, in every situation, you go and look and read. When God moved, they were at the end of themselves. Every time. They had to get to that place in order to trust Him. In order to call out to Him. In order to cry out to Him. And at some point, the church here in the American and the United States, we're going to find ourselves under great persecution. It's already begun. They're trying to change laws. They're pushing the, the line as far as they can to see what kind of re reaction they're going to get. Things are happening in different places around the country and around the world. But we're going to have to come to the place, and I believe it's going to come sooner than later, where we're going to find ourselves... Where well, Jesus is all we have. What are you going to do then? See, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you a little secret here. Many in the church today are not going to get that far. They'll cave. They will cave under the new regime. They will cave under the new system. They will cave in order to keep what they have as best they can. They will cave in order to not be persecuted. The time is coming. And again, you look at the third world countries who have, have any churches over there at all, they know that Jesus is all they have. And they cling to him. They walk for miles to come together to be with other believers. They meet in secret places with believers so that they won't be put in jail and beaten or killed. Not happened here yet, but it's going to. It's going to. And we need to be prepared for that. The world is heading for judgment. And we, the church, need to be awake and be prepared for what's coming. We need to submit to Him today. We need to trust Him today. It's time to get real with Jesus. Church playtime is over. Church playtime is over. And I'm speaking to every denomination. I'm speaking to every group. Every association, I'm speaking to Calvary Chapel as a whole itself. Playtime is over. We've settled as a whole. We've gotten comfortable. This is who we are. This is what we do. That's not what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. We're to come to Jesus and say, You are all I have. Use me however you see fit. And don't let any structural walls that have been built hold us from being who we're supposed to be. We've gotten fat and happy. When Jesus says, I'm going to whittle you down, you're going to lose some weight. I believe he's starting to whittle the church, even now. I believe that many are leaving the church for several reasons. Some, because they're not being fed, and they don't even know what it means to be fed. They've never really understood who Jesus is. Some are leaving because they choose sin over God's word. Some are leaving disoriented. And some don't think they're leaving at all. Some are staying in a place to where God's word is no longer valid. It's no longer truth. And those that are leaving are going to find a place that is teaching truth, adhering to God's word. We see church splits all the time. So in some places, people aren't leaving the church, but that church is dead. The letters to the churches of Revelation are speaking to us loud and clear right now. Every one of them. 
It's not this church or that church. It's all of them. You go and read every one of those letters to the churches, and every one of them applies to us today. We either uh, a, a corp, uh, we've have, we have a compromised. We're a dead church. We have allowed Jezebel in. We've allowed this to happen. We've allowed, whatever. You go read it, and it's happening somewhere in the church today. And God is saying, enough is enough. Do you love me? It's like you told Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Well, that's a question we have to answer for, our, for, for ourselves. We say we love him. We say we trust him. We say we want to go and we want to do what he wants us to do. But are we doing it? It's got to be outside these walls. And God is really, really putting that on my heart over and over and over again that we have got to get outside the walls and introduce people to Jesus. Not that we're inviting them to church so they can come and sit and fill up our churches. That we go out and show them who Jesus is. If they come here, great. doesn't matter about that. But if they come to know Jesus, then we need to be prepared to disciple them. Not just pray a prayer and count them as a number. But to disciple them and say, okay, this is what it means to know Jesus. And go through the word with them and spend time with them. This is something that's going to happen. I don't know how he's putting all this together, but it's something that is coming. As I'm speaking, God is putting this together in this community. God is moving. God knows his own. He knows his sheep. And we need to give him the glory for the things that he's done and the things that he is doing. Matthew 7, 21 through 27, I'm going to close with this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many other wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So I'll leave you with this this morning. What's the foundation you've built your house on? Is it Jesus the rock? Or is it the sand of the culture? That's going to be washed away. It's a prayer we all need to be seeking God on right now in the days we live in. It's between us and Him. It's between us and Him. Father. We